So hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to Disability Hacks Strategies for Arts Adaptations. My name is Dana Leah, and I am a white woman with short brown hair and blue glasses sitting in a bedroom with art around me. Uh, I am also the program manager for Intertwine Arts, the organization that is hosting this talk today, which is a nonprofit whose mission is to inspire creativity, joy, and self-confidence through freeform weaving for people of all ages with disabilities or chronic illness. Um, so today we are here for Disability Hacks, which is a webinar series presented by Intertwine Arts and hosted by weaving studio owners Yael Batia Hatch and Chiaki O'Brien. There will be a panel discussion between us all uh, for roughly an hour, followed by a Q&A, which we've blocked out half an hour for. We are going to take this time to explore the intersections of disabilities in the arts and how instruction can be adjusted for different parts of the life cycle. Last year, a while ago, uh, we delved into working with geriatric populations. Uh, this time we are focusing on adults, which may seem like a big topic, but I think it is seen as a given rather than something to talk about, which is why we should talk about it. Um, Yael and Chiaki, we're going to begin with visual descriptions um, and each of us talking about what types of adult populations we have experience with. Um, and so uh, take it away. Uh, uh, and if you could both introduce yourselves and then we'll launch into it. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. I am Chiaki O'Brien. I am uh, in Minnesota, uh, United States, and I, I am in my uh, Saudi weaving studio. And I, I am. I have a short black hair with lots of gray hair, uh, black glasses, and I have my Saudi. Uh, I didn't weave, but uh, I purchased a jacket. Um, this is woven by a person with mental disabilities, and one of my mentors in Japan, she put it together, and I have a navy blue shirt underneath of it. Um, so I am in Minnesota and September is my special month. Uh, I started Saudi in September in 1996. And I also, after I moved to Minnesota from Japan in 2004, um, I started taking uh, my own culture, uh, Japanese taiko drumming, and which I didn't do in Japan. Uh, and I started this in September 2008. And then both are like, you know, visual arts and performing arts. Uh, so I have been enjoying uh, these arts. And I also um, uh, do uh, Bengala mud dyeing. Actually, the mentor from Japan is in New York City at the Loop of the Loom uh, in Brooklyn studio that he's doing an exhibit. And also, I think he's the, it's the last day uh, he's doing a workshop there. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yael Batia. I have long blonde hair. I am a white female. Um, I'm sitting with a black shirt on and a uh, scarf that is not so really woven. Um, and but I do have my weaving behind me. I'm in a room with uh, one, two white panels and a purple panel behind me. Um, I learned about Saori. Uh, in 2013, when I ordered my first loom and had it brought to Israel. And from here, I continued to expand and became self-taught um, using the resources available to me uh, through Saori Japan and through other studio owners. And I did have an opportunity to do a Saori workshop and um, sorry, an internship at Loop of the Loom in 2017, uh, in October, November of 2017. Um, currently, I uh, am completing my education um, certificate in Israel, and I will be hopefully, in starting in November, be reopening my studio to offer free style weaving courses. So. Uh, and I'll just do a little bit more background on myself. Uh, and also I have woven earrings uh, that I'm wearing. So this is Danalia. Uh, 
So I have worked at Intertwine Arts for over a little over two years, which is where I learned how to weave uh, and fell in love with the style and philosophy of sewery. Uh, uh, but I've been teaching for a very long time. Uh, I worked at museums for roughly seven years before working at Intertwine Arts, where I would teach all ages, doing tours, doing art workshops, and all that fun stuff. Um, and I'm also autistic, um, which influences a lot of my creative work. Um, uh, so uh, we all have a lot of experience working with adults. Um, so I work with intertwined arts, so primarily a lot of the people that we work with have disabilities or chronic illness. Um, and I've worked with a lot of adults uh, when I was doing tours and teaching workshops. Um, uh, so what kind of crowds come through your studios or have come through your studios? Uh, go ahead. OK, so for me, um, we, when we're speaking about adults in particular, many of the adults that come to my studio uh, or haven't participated in my workshops, um, they either come as part of a family group because I offer uh, collaborative family workshops. Um, or they come as um, independently with, you know, signing up for themselves or with another friend. Um, what I found most interesting is I was reflecting on the fact that with adults, and when I refer to adults, it's basically from about the age of 20 to 55-ish, <laughs> 60s, um, what I find what's interesting with this age range is that especially when they're coming as individuals, um, they need to uh, sort of unlearn a lot of things. You know, they come in with a certain set of expectations of themselves, and I give them the opportunity and the tool to let go of a lot of things. And that's been very, very important in the way I set up my workshops and the way I set up the environment. What I found the most challenging um, group are adults that come with their families. So whether they come with their kids or if they come with their elderly parents or nieces and nephews, um, they have a very hard time allowing themselves to let go of the adult guiding parental role inside the workshop. Meaning everybody's on the same level, whether it's a three or five year old child up until they're teenagers, they're all coming for the first time to be exposed to the beautiful, you know, freestyle um, weaving that I'm teaching. And what I find it very important is that for adults, I'm trying to tactfully explain to them, you know, it's okay, let them try it, let them, you know, it's okay, just let them, you know, follow the process. And for, they, for themselves as well, to really let go and sort of just follow through with the guiding steps that I explain to them and practice and practice and practice. And then I find that by the end of the session that the parents are more relaxed, the children are more relaxed, and there's this inter, inter um, generational communication that goes on where they all realize that they've achieved something or they've experienced a process together without one being more, more um, experienced than the other. Which is a, it's a big transition, especially for adults. Uh, so you want to go ahead, Jackie? Sure. Um, I'm going to just ask, uh, answer to what you asked, like what the population. Mm -hmm. uh, I do, uh, this is a studio that people come, but also I do many off sites. So I actually basically work with all ages and all abilities. I just uh, now I work with all the adults visiting their facilities, um, and I do like community ed, and sometimes a group of people with uh, mental or physical disabilities. Uh, but mainly, I uh, most of the population is uh, adults, and. Like Misao Joe, the Saudi founder said, everybody has some kind of disabilities, even though you nobody can see it. So even she said, well, I have to have glasses to read now, <laughs> you know? So even she said, that's your disabilities. So yeah, so I will stop from now. 
No, I think that's a, I think everybody needs help in different ways is, is sort of what you're saying. Uh, and Misao said, uh, which I think is really apt, especially like when we're talking about adults, because adults have an issue with like feeling like they need help. Like we should be independent and be able to do things ourselves. And so needing help in a, and even if it's doing art, like can sometimes be a barrier to the creation process, I think. Um, and I also liked what Yael said about unlearning, because um, I think that's also it too. Uh, I was thinking right before getting into this about how like when you're a kid, you're like, when I'm an adult, I can do whatever I want. Uh, but I feel like once you become an adult, you're like, oh, wait, I can't do whatever I want. Uh, there's all these like things that you feel shame about. Uh, in exactly. Terms of I, I actually wrote down in my rough notes, I said when, as you said, when you become adult, there's always the, the would have, the could have, and the should have. And then I sh would have done that, I could have done that, I should have done that. It's, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves, and especially when you're dealing with adults that are at an age where they have either young children or, or elderly parents, so what we call the sandwich generation, where they find themselves in this paradox of of uh, you know wanting to become independent or kind of live their lives but they're also responsible caregivers on both ends of the life cycle and so being able to let go of that in a moment of being in a workshop or you know experiencing that we're weaving it's it's a big change it's a big shift because that we're expressing to them that you can let go you don't have to plan anything the only thing that you actually need to do is choose color and you need to choose, you know, what impulse, what, what speaks to you, what's the first thing that grabs your eye. You don't need to spend seven minutes, 10 minutes, you know, color coordinating because that's not how we get started in the beginning with the beginner um, or introductory session. So as adults, we're not often given choices. We're not often given the ability to choose, oh, I want to do this. Most of our lives revolve around, we have to do something. We should do something. We need to do something. Um, we talk about, in the, I guess the popular term now is adulting. Okay, I'm going to be adulting today. You know, it turns into a verb. Um, I feel that it's a pity because as adults or a grown human beings or grown up children that we need to have the ability to keep evolving and being a work in progress and we need to be able to have the fun stuff and we need to be able to experience play and laughter and joy and making mistakes and seeing how we can make those mistakes in a safe environment and it's a beautiful thing about the way all of our workshops and all of our studios are set up is that we have the freedom to do that and even the equipment itself, it's not delicate equipment. It needs to be treated with respect. But when I hear the shuttle dropping or I hear something else fall, I said, oh, it's, it's okay to pick it up. Like everything is fixable, you know? Even learn when they accidentally get uh, damaged or they get accidentally bumped when transportation, like you said, Chiaki, you go off site sometimes. I've also done off site where you're trying to pack up five looms in a station wagon and you're traveling two hours and, and bumps and bruises happen. But the beautiful thing about that is everything functional. When you open it up, you can smooth it out, you can tighten the screw, like, you know, everything is, is um, very fixable and very flexible. And that's what I feel as an instructor is when I do teach two adults that I see, I watch, I watch their, um, behavior. I watch their actions and I see sometimes they're very particular about their edges or they're very particular about making sure it's straight. And then I go and I, I guide them to the idea of, you know what, just leave the edges for now and just keep on going without worrying about the edges. Or I'll say to them, I see that you are really concerned about the edges being aligned. You know, let's try for the next couple hand uh, finger lengths don't worry about the edges, don't look at them, just you know, keep going. And it really, it requires a lot of breath work for them because they really have to take a deep breath and let it go and give, be given permission to make mistakes. 
And I feel like that is our um part of our role and responsibility is to give that permission in the beginning to say, it's okay. There's no such thing as mistakes. You know, Ms. Archer said there's no such thing as mistakes. It's okay. Yeah, I really also respond to the uh the playfulness that you're talking about. Um because again, like when you're a kid, you're like, I can do whatever I want when I'm an adult. But then when you're an adult, you're like, oh, I like eating ice cream for dinner is maybe <laughs> like I feel shame about doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's you shouldn't feel shame to do things that just make you feel good every once in a while. Um, and something that uh, so I did grab some uh, uh, pictures that I thought might be good parts of these points and one that really came to mind immediately when we were talking about doing this uh, is so something I come across especially with people who are neurodivergent um, is that their families will shame them for doing quote-unquote childlike things um, so you know stuffed animals cutesy stuff liking like Disney or you know, cartoony things, like oftentimes they'll be like, oh, you should, you know, do grown up things. You're a grown up. Um, and, you know, I'm saying this with stuffed animals behind me myself. Uh, but one of the things that um, I encourage in our workshops is to engage that playfulness that people have and that love of cartoons and things. And we have lots of people who make dolls. We have lots of people um, who make, um, figurines uh and then one person i remember said that they weren't allowed to have shopkins which are these plastic toys uh that look like things you would shop for so it's like grapes and uh you know maybe like a soft drink uh and so this person wanted to make a grape shopkin um and so that's what we did this is a grape shopkin uh that she wove and added some beads onto uh, and it made her so happy because normally she's not allowed to do these things because she's seen as an adult, uh, but it really brought her a lot of joy. And that made me really happy to see that I could encourage that and give her a space to express that too when there are certain other spaces that society would shame her for having this fun thing. Um, uh, so I thought that would be nice to share. Uh, I'll I'll describe on the screen, there's a... Uh, a red woven object with a bunch of pink, purple, and red beads on it. Um, and there are two eyeballs made out of beads uh, uh, being held by someone. Uh, so, and it's very cute, <laughs> subjectively, but I think it's cute. Um, so I just wanted to share that. <laughs> uh, I, I, um, at the beginning of the session, well, yesterday I had two ladies who are uh, first time trying the Saudi weaving. Uh, so um, usually people at the beginning, I, until you get used to the rhythm of weaving, and especially if, it's, uh, if this is their first time weaving experience, um, they are kind of a little bit of still, am I doing okay? You know, and I usually say at the beginning, any classes for when I teach adults, you take out your brains, leave them in your car or outside. And you are five years old, even though you cannot remember when you're five, but you just follow your heart. And, you know, sometimes people laugh, but, uh, you know, sometimes people say, yeah, I am doing, I'm being five or I was five. And, but some, you know, many adults, we have seen enough weavings or uh, at the museum or stores. So they have this image of weaving. It's nicely rectangles and it has to be like edges are so straight, even. And then the kids are the one, they don't even know what they are doing. They are just playing with colors. And sometimes I have a whole family come and they usually mothers are the ones at the beginning, I am making a scarf. <laughs> and then they are the one usually, even though I said, don't worry about straight edges, just express yourself. You are not doing the other kind of style of weaving. This is Saudi weaving after talking about what Saudi weaving is all about. But still many people try to make it edge, you know, edges so even. And then those struggles, even though that's okay, you are expressing yourself. It, you know, nowadays, jeans have holes and they're still new 
and that, that everything's okay. It doesn't have to be rectangle scarves. And, but some people still struggle trying to make it even and takes time. And then in two hours, kids finish a long scarf. And then the one mothers who are talking about, I'm making a scarf, finish a placement. So that's the very good example of being in a moment. And because we know the adults, we have so many experience seeing something, doing something. So try to imitate what you've seen. For you is the weaving is perfectly rectangle. Uh, so that's a usually uh, very kind of, some people have this, oh, I, I'm not even beating consistently and then you don't have to. Um, so some pe people, it's hard to let go. And sometimes I have a person like, I want to make like this. So this person brings a picture. <laughs> And I want to make exactly like this. And I don't even have the exact material to start with. And so sometimes it's hard to, you know, explain you are not he here to copy this. And this is a Saudi weaving. And sometimes, you know, I am an engineer. I have to know the finished product. <laughs> so everybody's different, the background. Um, so that's my job to just let them be, you know, enjoy themselves while you know, they are here. There was a reason why they are here. So it is challenging for me to let them, you know, oh, this is fun. I didn't need to copy this or, you know, so everybody is different. So that's the interesting part, but also challenging for us to be a facilitator. Yeah, and I mean, trying to set up an atmosphere where people feel comfortable to experiment, um, I think can be a big challenge. Um, yes, that's my big plus uh, job to create a positive and a cheerful. Um, and we all, even though you don't know each other at the end, you're friends and inspiring each other while you're weaving. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you do in terms of setup or like framing when you first start with someone who's an adult? Like, what, how do you set up that sort of environment? Can I respond to that? Uh, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to respond to what you uh, asked, uh, Leah, but also I'm going to respond to what Rhea asked in the um, in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. So Rhea asked, some adults will not use the treasure box. How do you encourage this experimentation? So this goes, this is incorporated in the way I um, present. Uh, my, my workshop, which means um, from the beginning, everybody is sitting not at the room in the beginning, and I have everyone take one shuttle, and I pass around the box that has all the pre-wound um, uh, bobbins. I said, okay, pick the first color that speaks to you, and if they're starting to take a long time, I'll start to count down from three. I'll be, I'll say, okay, three, two, one, okay, great, you found a great color, and then move on, because the idea is I want them to be to really work with their impulses, to really go with their gut feeling. Because when I start to see a child or an adult reach for that bright orange, and then they start to pull back and realize there, there's something telling them that no, I'm not allowed to take what, what my gut is telling me to do. So that's really, really important to encourage. Um, in a way, in the beginning, I explained to them. I'm going to teach you three techniques and to get you started. And then afterwards, you can incorporate whatever you need to do. And I really, really get the ball rolling because I want within five minutes of them stepping into the studio to be sitting at the loom and weaving. Um, so what I encourage them to do is, especially if we're doing collaborative family workshops, which is my main um, experience right now, is teaching adults that have come with their family is as um, each family member is taking turns at the loom. Sometimes we have anywhere from one to or four looms set up, and they all have to take turns depending on the size of the family or the group. What ends up happening is I tell them, I show them the basics, you know, hands, um, feet, feet. They're really to go with the rhythm and um, to keep it simple. And I tell them all, okay, you can weave your first uh, three finger line and then switch off with somebody in their family. And when I do the switch off, I explained to them there's a really interesting way that we can bring in another color instead of just cutting and starting another line. 
So that's when I introduced the interlocking and I explained that in American Sign Language, the, the sign for friends is two fingers interlocking. And this is very similar to what interlocking weaving is, is it's two threads coming together like a hug and pulling each other and balancing each other out. So I really have them do it visually because I want them to see that not everything has to be finished. We can always blend in colors, you can blend in the next color. And especially when you're working with family, you have to understand that everybody participating in this. Just because one person finished their turn doesn't mean we should cut them and stop and the next person continue. We always need to have that blending process. Um, what I find that best is I don't introduce the treasures or the treasure box um, until later on, once everyone's fully established that feeling of rhythm, the hands, feet, feet, and they're more confident. And that, that's in about 15 to 20 minutes within the beginning of a workshop. That's when I introduce the treasure box. And again, I have everyone pause so I can direct their attention. I don't want to be teaching a workshop. It doesn't matter if it's two people or four or 30. I don't want to be competing for their attention. So I have everyone pause and I explain to them the different types of treasure that I offer. So we have raw wool, we have recycled sorry silk, we have thread scraps, and we also have fabric strips. And I show them all on the weaving exactly how each one can be incorporated. And I really, really encourage them. And the beginning of almost all my students or my groups that do weaving, they almost always have treasure in the beginning because I highly encourage them to do it. I don't exactly like to say force, but in the first section, there's always going to be a little bit of pops of color based on what I've encouraged them to do. Once I let them do their own thing, they tend to choose um, to continue adding pops of color and some don't. And every once in a while, I ask, do you want to try adding in pops of color? Do you want to try thread? And they'll say no, which is completely within their right as well. You know, we have a, a certain way of teaching, um, but that doesn't mean that every student wants to do it their way either. Uh, and just for context, if people don't know what we mean by treasure box, uh, a treasure box is just like bits and scraps and often it's scraps from uh, other weavings or projects, but it can also be like found things like uh, ribbon. Yeah, we have an example. <laughs> uh, uh, Chiaki is holding up a basket full of scraps, ribbons, bits and bobs of fibery things. Uh, sometimes sequins, like it's just like anything, little bits and bobs that are thrown together. And so people can grab a little bit out of that and incorporate it into their weaving. <laughs> Thank you for the example. <laughs> <laughs> I have, a, this is such a small one that I can take off site, but I have huge bag that uh, uh, I'm collecting. <laughs> And people know, so people bring their own treasure box to me. <laughs> so I have variety, sometimes feather, uh, like somebody's after, you know, project, the knitted project. <laughs> so I have lots of, even that sometimes the other day was knitting needles. <laughs> <laughs> so they are giving me a lot of opportunity to be more creative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's always great when people come in with their own stuff. Yes. Yes. I have um, a friend in, in Israel, her name is Naomi Dagan, and um, she has a daughter that is also a story weaver. And in some of her examples, she displayed um, at Free Weaver Studio in London at their exhibition last year. Um, but let's get, there's this amazing thing. She actually had socks inside of her weaving. I saw, you know, bits of clothing, like whole pieces of clothing inside her weaving. And it was amazing because to me, it was not only was it beautiful, but it was also for me, I could laugh because I could identify with the whole missing sock thing. You know, you buy three pairs of socks, you put them in the washing machine, you put them in the dryer and you get four. You know, it's just like you, where did the sock go? And then when you're doing treasure and when you're adding in um, the surprises in your own weaving, especially 
whole piece of clothing is also amazing as well because it's it's just anything goes. Anything goes. Uh uh, we'll jump to you in a second, Chiaki, but I want to go back to that sort of original question of like, how do we set up like people, adults to be creative and feel comfortable being creative? And so one thing that I do, uh, I find it funny when I'm home, I tend to to weave a little bit neater and sort of like, I guess, more traditional sometimes. Uh, but when I'm teaching, uh, I'll often sit next to the person who's weaving and I don't want to hover over them. If I'm hovering, then they feel like they're being watched and they need to do it right. Uh, and so I'll often have a piece of weaving myself, usually just like a piece of cardboard that I warped and I'll be making my own project. And usually that's when I experiment and go, go off the rails. Like I use weird materials and I make it very like rough and ready uh, because I feel like when I do that in front of someone who's weaving, it encourages them to be more experimental and try new things. Cause I'm the expert quote unquote, and mine isn't looking beautiful and perfect and neat. And so that encourages them to, to try new things too. Um, but yeah, I uh, just wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, it's um like yesterday. Uh, so those two new people are there weaving and then the, one of them actually wound a bobbin too big and really loose. So the other lady who uh, experienced Saudi a little bit, she had the same experience before. So she told her, which was great, I, you know, I didn't jump in. You know, that happened to me the other day. Instead of rewinding it too nicely, this is, you know, just pull the bobbin out and then spread the yarn out and then you can put it in your weaving. And then instead of just trying to make it wind the night neatly, so, that was nice that she was, you know, giving her idea and I said, yeah, she made a very nice piece and then I, uh, she also had a picture of her own piece so she was showing this is what happened to you know, same thing when I wound up weird bobbing and uh, it was fr frustrating first but this gave me idea to okay just take the bobbing out and then spread and then lots of textures so. That's why it's very nice to see that to see that weavers are interacting, inspiring each other. And I was wondering if she's gonna do that. And she actually, this person later took the bobbin out and they, thank you, this is fun. So that's the you know good thing that you can wind nicely again back to the bobbin and then just weave. But it was very beautiful that you know they were inspiring each other and then this person was accepting what she you know gave her idea that sometimes that's the, your happy accident even mm -hmm. bobbing winding bobbing you know it's a happy accident it's not just when you're weaving and then because you wound a little too big and loose gave you opportunity to do something with it so it was very nice to see that they're interacting each other I really love that term, happy accident. Yes. It's such a wonderful thing. I always, when I hear my favorite sound and when I'm teaching is when someone says, uh-oh, oops. And I immediately turn over and I said, it's okay. It seems like you, you, you touched on a new technique now. And I'll explain to them, you know, it's not an oops. You didn't switch your feet. And now we have a double thread and now it looks nice because it's thicker. So let's see what happens when you do it again, you know? And really a lot of the, um, it takes a lot of encouragement. I have to encourage my, um, my students and I have to encourage myself because there is a way that I want them to experience this, but I also have to let go as well. You know, I have to, I, I, I'm teaching myself, I'm learning from my students that, okay, you know, I said that really there's no such thing as mistakes in your weaving. I said the only the only uh, time that you want to make sure that things are done correctly is when you are threading it, threading the warp to make sure that the 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 threads are not crossed over because it does impede the way that you're weaving. It's okay if you skipped a, a dent, or it's okay that you have missed the thread, or that you mix up the colors a little bit, but. At the end of the day, we want everyone to have a positive experience that they can move forward, that everything's functioning. 
But everything else, it's an open blank um, canvas for them. Not only the colors and the tool and the, the raw material that they have, but also within themselves, that they're able to really kind of dig down into themselves and really express themselves in a way that they haven't really had an opportunity to do before. Uh, and I like in the example you had, Chiaki, uh, when you were talking about, uh, it's sort of like you're trying to redirect frustration. And that's a lot, of, I think, of what you do with adults, because adults get frustrated really quickly if they don't get it right away. Uh, and then you're just trying to redirect all of those feelings so that they never feel like they get to a stopping point. At least I feel. Yeah, and it is, you know, just just for our job, especially yesterday, this one of the students was, you know, she was a nice guy, a facilitator, you know, you don't have to rewind it, just do this. <laughs> uh, so that I feel like, oh, she's understanding, you know, you know, this gives her opportunity to do other ways other than being frustrated. And so it's, everybody's different. You know, everybody, and even this lady who experienced, uh, she's been doing Saudi for a little bit. She also does traditional, you know, Scandinavian weaving too. So she can kind of know the both sides, which I don't understand. You know, I mean, I appreciate, but I can't do those huge rooms. Um, but I think because of that, she's kind of, for that Scandinavian weaving or whatever she's doing, she cannot do that. But this one, it's so free that she can do whatever you want. So I think that's what she does both. That, you know, both are weavings, but it's totally different. She knows the end, this, this weaving. But Saudi, you don't know the end. Nobody knows. So that's the probably uh, she keeps doing a Saudi too. Um. One thing I just wanted to to sort of maybe go back to or, or try to just think a little bit more about too is, um, so, you know, we've been talking about a lot about adults in general. Adults is a huge group <laughs> to cover. Last time we talked about geriatric populations. And so we focused on disabilities that specifically affect people who are geriatric. For adults, I mean, there's a very wide spectrum of disability that can be there. Um, and I think something I, again, I prepared some <laughs> things coming into this is um, everybody's different. We know, and we do know that, every, like you were saying, you know, everybody has maybe some sort of help that they need or support. Um, and I think that's something that I've really learned more and more. Um, recently, Intertwine Arts worked at the Andrew High School Talking Book and Braille Library, very long title. Uh, <laughs> and, okay. uh, so the people we are working with had low vision or blindness. Mm -hmm. And when we went in, we had a like sort of a one hit all sort of idea of what that would mean. But uh, what I have learned is that low vision or blindness is very varied. Uh, there, It's not just, oh, someone can't see or can't see very well. It's some people are sensitive to light. Some people, uh, uh, you know, have some certain color blindnesses, some people, you know, again, it's various levels of visibility. Um, and so I want to share um, a picture that I have that kind of shows some of this variability um, that we learned how to accommodate as we were going um, and people were expressing themselves to. Um, so I have a picture that is a bunch of sort of DIY do-it-yourself looms on like cardboard uh, and paper plates. Um, and there's very variation to these. So we have the paper plates with a bunch of different colored warps. We have some um, that are on black uh, sort of cardboard, while others are on more of like a tan cardboard. Uh, we have a wooden frame loom as well. And we have all of these variations because we came in actually just with the tan cardboard and then found that people were having a really hard time seeing the warp uh, against that tan background. Um, and so we we're like, okay, so we're gonna get these black cardboards so that there's more contrast with the yarn. But, and some people were like, great, this is helping me. But there is one or two people who said, oh, actually that's too harsh of a contrast. It actually hurts my eyes. 
So then uh, I have one that has this lighter blue warp and they said that was perfect for them. Uh, another person had uh, near total blindness as far as I know, I don't know his exact uh, you know, disability. And so he needed more space rather than a contrast so that he could feel the yarn better and get his fingers in and under. And so then we use this wooden frame loom for that person. So disability, like, again, everybody needs support. Everybody needs support in different ways. And as a teacher, you have to be adept to that. And also sometimes you have to be really intuitive. Um, mm -hmm. Some people were very direct about what they needed. Like when that person was like, I don't like this high contrast, do you have other options? Other people are quieter and they don't tell you what they need or maybe they don't even know what they need. Mm -hmm. um, some people, uh, when they started with the tan, they were like, well, this is what I started with, so I'm gonna complete it. And it's like, well, we have, you know, you've expressed you're having trouble, like we have these other options, but they were sort of feeling stuck or like they couldn't do the other option until they did the first one. Um, so, you know, working with adults is, and disability specifically, is really a broad cat thing to talk about. And I thought this was like a good example of talking about that. Um, uh, and I don't know, uh, I think that's something that maybe I want to ask if you've experienced this, Chiaki and Yael, of someone who maybe doesn't know how to ask um, for help. Um, yeah, I actually did, a, it's maybe they are high school, so maybe it's not, they are not adult, but I did a residency at a, a state academy for the blind for a week, six, seven years ago. And so I knew I would be working with people who that can't see or very low vision. So I used the Saudi room. So I had lots of um, textured warp ready so they can feed it even though they can't see the colors. Um, like you said, there are so many people who are not just can't see, you know, they have multiple disabilities. Uh, this particular boy I remember is he was born deaf and blind. So that was the time I've never uh, seen for the first time how he, he communicates with translators with the hands and he even walked in a campus without cane without any help and surprisingly the his translator said he can bike in town by himself so he has very different senses that you know we don't have and that was very amazing experience then um for people who can't you know doesn't ask is just probably still hesitate, not relaxed. And then sometimes I say, you know, are you okay? Or would you like to take a look at other people doing? Or um, or sometimes they just like the color. <laughs> so I try not to do so much with them, then cannot be, this person cannot be in a moment. I'm interrupting this person. And I, you know, as, as long as this person can communicate, I don't need to probably interrupt, inter, uh, interrupt. Uh, wait until this person says something to me or other people. Or sometimes if they come, if this person comes with friends or, you know, family member, she, this person is just too shy, but this person can talk to his friend or family, but not to me. You know, sometimes there's like, between go between this family person can be oh he wants to do this to me instead of him as, asking me directly but that's okay too but uh, hopefully at the end i'm always hoping i hope he can come to me and talk to me uh but i try not to not to interrupt especially if this person is looking like he's having fun mm -hmm. i it's not related specifically to teaching adults but to unteaching adults, I ran a workshop for kids last year. Um, and a lot of the parents wanted to hang out. They wanted to sit with their kids and hang out. And the first lesson, I figured it was okay because there was a language barrier between myself. I, I teach mainly in English, and most of my students are Hebrew speakers. Um, so it's normally fine. Um, I, but by the second and third classes, I had to actually be a gatekeeper and encourage the parents, okay, this is the kid's time. 
and you can come back later. And it was very interesting because I don't like to push people away from a creative experience, but this creative experience was for their kids, not for them. So I wanted to figure out a way that I could encourage them to encourage their kids. And one of those was by letting go and telling them, okay, your kids are doing a great job. They're doing amazing. And I'm so ha happy that you want to stay and help them. But they're doing really well on their own. So, you know, you can come pick them up in 45 minutes to an hour. And they'll be happy to share their work with you. But they should go back to the challenge of, of being an adult or being in adulthood. It's really letting go. Letting go of that control factor and letting go of the... the the desire to want to fix things or to help or to to hover because our parents or adults that's sort of what we are sort of led to believe that that's part of our role you know if you're lost on the street go to an adult ask for help you know you look up to somebody and being a um, an artist and a freestyle weaver and we consider ourselves facilitators the guides you know, we're very flexible. We're not the authority. And one thing I find is very interesting with um, family groups is that once, you know, once the families are underway and they, they, they sort of, you know, they're settled into their rhythm, I take notice of which family members are really sort of kind of got the hang of it and they have the, con the confidence. And I compliment them on it. I say, wow, you're, you're the expert now. You become the expert. It looks like your sister needs help. Or it looks like, you know, your mom might want a different color. How about you go and help them? You know, or how about you show your mom how to wind it again? Because I don't want to be the, um, I don't want it to be teacher focused. I don't want it to be instructor focused. I want it to be that we're, we're all learning from each other. And that. Like you said, we have to, just like you said, we have to redirect frustration. I also have to redirect um, authority or redirect knowledge because everyone actually does know what they're doing. It's not really hard. It's, it's more the breaking down of the barriers that people put up in their mind rather than the physical barriers. Mm -hmm. um, just that all the equipment is very, very adapted. And I've found a couple of times when I didn't have the necessary tools, I had to improvise. You know, I had a student that wasn't able to reach the beta bar. So I just, you know, I just looped on a piece of fabric and they just pulled it rather than having to invest in some other kind of tool to make it easy for them. We just need to say, what, what more do you need? How, how can I make this come closer to you? You know, do you need a higher chair? Do you need um, better lighting? Do you need music? You need silence. You know, it's there's a lot of things where students themselves they know what they need. It's just asking the right questions, and that's what we have to remind ourselves. It's just like, okay, how can I help? What do you need right now? How can we make this better for you? I liked what you said about sort of like also changing authority. Uh, and I so this is a sort of different example, but I find the philosophy very similar to Sowery. Uh, I worked at a junkyard playground uh, on Governor's Island for kids. Uh, and they have a playwork philosophy, um, which is really just like allowing the kid to make things and do things however they want. You do, it's not directed play, it's totally free. Uh, and adults are not allowed in. Uh, and mind you, they have like hammers and saws and nails uh, which often freaks uh, adults out because it's letting go of control and the idea that it might not be safe and they might not use it right. Um, but without the adults allowed, kids are actually like super, you know, comfortable and aware and they like they know it's a dangerous object. Those, a lot of them will come up to me and be like, is this OK? And I'm like, yeah, it's OK. Just be safe. Like, do just use your judgment. Uh, and like very little, it's actually been shown that uh, these junkyard playgrounds are safer than uh, regular playgrounds. Because on regular playgrounds, you assume it's safe. Uh, and so kids do wilder things that hurt themselves. Um, uh, and so I love uh, all the funny things that adults do to try to get in and they'll still try to yell at their kids, 
hey, don't do this, do this, stay over there. Uh, we've had adults sneak in <laughs> to try to monitor their kid. Uh, so it's really interesting how attached adults are to authority. And I do think that it has a big part to play when we're teaching, because uh, all of a sudden there's a new authority figure, um, but also that you want to maintain levels of authority, like you were saying with families, like this idea of like sort of the patriarch matriarch uh, needs to still remain in that art space making space. And it's like, no, in this art making space, there is no, uh, there's no authority here. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I really wish that the junk job playground had adult hours because that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> we've, we've talked about it. Plenty of people are like, oh, I want to come in here. Uh, like, I want to do this. And we've talked about like maybe doing like a sleepover or stuff like that. When I was there, I haven't been there in a bit. Uh, but uh, we're not They were. I know at that time they weren't there yet. Maybe someday. <laughs> Um, but it's very fun if anybody's in New York and you have kids or no kids. Very fun place to to go with them. Um, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what else? I'm going to look at our little notes. Feel free to, to just talk about things. Um, well, I have one very interesting uh, experience, both in Japan and then here after I moved here in the States. Um, when I was a community event, uh, having rooms, and then I was weaving, and then of course, usually kids are the one. What are you doing? And and it was their parents. So like two girls came to me, and I let them, you know, would you like to weave? And the moms, two mothers, they are both, you know, friends too. And the one mother said, "I will be away reading a book." So when you're done, come back to me. The other mom stayed with her daughter right by her room. And then she started doing, you know, do this color. And then, why are you doing this? And then, you screw up and all this. After I said, no, you don't have to worry about it. Just let them be, you know, her. But the mom was just, you know, kept doing it. So I said, mom, you know, <laughs> this girl is having fun. And then actually this girl, the other girl who has mom right next to her started kind of look so sad. So I have another room open. So I asked mom, would you like to weave with her? And she said, no, I can't do it. <laughs> and then, you know, but you were just teaching her to do this, do that. But, you know, there's a room, you can make something small with her. It's just, it happened in Japan too, that, you know, being adults and how, you know, some adults are like, oh, they have to learn the basic first and then do whatever you want. But I also teach, you know, this is the one two and the switch feet or whatever. And it's nice to see even the parents, you know, as an individual that has to be this way and has to be that way. And then the other mom is just, okay, I will wait for you over there. It was a very interesting contrast. Uh, we're about to move into our sort of Q&A portion. Um, I just wanted to throw in one thought. Uh, it's sort of a personal thing that I just wanted to, to mention, but, uh, you know, I'm an adult and I learned weaving somewhat recently uh, in terms of uh, uh, compared to Chiaki and Yell, especially. Uh, and I also am autistic and I got my diagnosis later in life. Um, and so I can say sort of from the, the learner point of view as an adult learning how to weave for the first time and also having like a neurodivergence, uh, it's really hard to to assert uh, needing accommodation, needing help, and do that playfulness. Uh, it's something I'm actively fighting as I'm sort of taking my art seriously. Um, I'm trying to be more playful with what I make. I make these monster pillows is, my, is one of my projects to try to engage that playfulness. And also trying to like think about and ask for accommodation is something I'm really not used to. I'm not used to wearing my headphones all the time, even though it helps me a lot to do that. Um, because I feel like I shouldn't have to. Uh, and so I really understand when there are adults with disabilities trying to, either trying to ask for help, not knowing how to ask for help, like struggling with the perfectionism. Like I, I feel that on a da very daily basis, I would say. Um, and so I wanted to throw that in. Um, but I we are moving. Oh, go ahead. 
Sorry, I was I didn't mean to interrupt, but I wanted to add my final thoughts as well uh, towards the end as well. That I sort of isolated. I wrote in a I wrote a set of notes that I find that with adults they have certain needs, and this is I mean it goes for everybody across the whole life cycle, but specifically for adults, I find that they need quietude. They need not necessarily absolute silence, but they need a place that feels quiet to them, whether it means no music or subtle, like, you know, low background noise or low music. They need quietude. They also need interaction. They need respectful communication. So the communication as an instructor to a student or a student to an instructor, it needs to be uh, like you said, an even even um playing field. It's not about a question of being more authority. I have knowledge that I'm sharing. So when you share something, sharing is not a hierarchical act. It's more of a, an equal act, going back and forth. Um, they also need boundaries. We need to respect their boundaries, not only the personal space, but also the physical and emotional space. You know, if you see that they're struggling. Maybe give them time to work out that struggle themselves before interjecting or before, you know, digging too deep. Um, positive feedback, always, always, always positive feedback, you know, to truly try to get them to see the beauty of what they're doing. And that's even more difficult sometimes when you have people that are so resistant to letting go that it's really hard for them to be receptive of genuine and authentic feedback. And also validation. Validation is super, super important for anyone, but specifically for adult uh, creators, is that they need to validate that they've made this choice, they're choosing to do something, they're, they're expressing themselves. And it comes with a lot of insecurity. You know, is this okay? You know, people want feedback, but they also want validation. Like, no, you picked it, you did great, this looked amazing. I would like to see where this is gonna go. Um, and then what I find is that there's this threshold of vulnerability that needs to be recognized and supported because as adults, we're coming from a very vulnerable perspective. And the key is that we need to build a rapport with adults in a very short period of time. It's very hard to do that, but we can do our best. And this gives our students a sense of security and to try something new and to risk, as Chiaki said, happy accidents. And we can also be in tune with their needs. So we're guiding them in a process towards an end product, but the product is not, is only secondary to the actual experience. So we're like, you know, bringing them on a journey and we're guiding them, but, you know, they are going to end up with their product, but that's not the main point. The main point is the journey itself. Do you have any last thoughts, Chiaki? <laughs> um, well, I... <laughs> we can also a, go to the Q and A, but just wanted to like, give the yeah, opportunity. I mean, when I I always you know introduce Saori, which is my joy and changed my life big time. And I always some people say you know oh I had you have art background or whatever. I always say I didn't like art. I don't have back art background. My my sewing project was done by my mom when I was school. So just enjoy, and especially this is your first time ex weaving experience you know, just enjoy Be like I said, five years old. And if you are making progress, and if you're happy, I don't need to help you. <laughs> so it's just a creating positive. So that means I have to really be healthy. You know, I have to be positive, even though I have a negative, you know, bad day. When I teach, introduce Saudi, I just have to be positive And, you know, so that's always kind of I have to bring the positive atmosphere and the joy that I learned, you know, 27 years ago. So, I mean, I try not to do much and at only the beginning is the important thing that like what Saudi is, because there are so many weaving styles in the, this world. I only know Saudi, so I can't say much about the other styles, but uh, um, yeah, so I always, Whenever any topic, I just have to say that I have to bring the joy <laughs> and the positive atmosphere. 
Yeah. And I think what you said about also like some adults are like, oh, I don't like art or, oh, I'm not an artist. That Then that's firmly in their head. So that's part of the unlearning. That's a whole other thing, but we only have yeah. so much time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we have a uh, very active comments, uh, which is exciting. Um, so we have one person who said, uh, I work at NIAD Art Center, NIAD Art Center in Richmond, California, an art center for disabled adults. We just got our second Sayori loom. Our artists love it. We adapted the pedals to make them easier to use. And we're getting some advice in the chat about that. Um, so there is an adaptive shelf that Sayori makes. Uh, we actually use those in many of our programs. Um, and there are also hand switchers for people who can't use their legs. There's also uh, height adjusters where you can make the loom a little bit higher that we use sometimes. Um, uh, and so I can share some of those, actually. I do have uh, images, if anybody is curious. Uh, I just need to pop up this. All right. Um, so there is this bar that can get attached if somebody has a hard time reaching. And Yael mentioned, uh, if the bar is still too shallow for somebody to reach, you can just take any old ribbon, uh, or, you know, scrap of cloth that's long and tie it around the beater bar. That way people can just use that to pull. Um, and also there's this added shelf on this um, loom. Uh, and this is so that usually when you're weaving, you're holding uh, the shuttle and you have to kind of pass it back and forth between your hands. But with the shelf, you can put the shuttle onto the shelf. You can maybe see it peeking on the other side uh, and just push it rather than having to hold it and you push it to either side. Um, so that's if people maybe have weakness in their arms or hands, um, then they can move it a lot easier. Um, and it has these helpful little um, uh, orange circles at the end. So if you have somebody who has a, a, a fast hand or a <laughs> little more, more force behind them, uh, it doesn't go flying off. It catches in this little orange circle on the side. Um, I like to I like to use the adaptive shelf with a uh, very enthusiastic children as well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know they also can have a range of you know from with no typical and atypical um manifestations. But what I find is when you have very enthusiastic kids, they really like to toss the shuttle and it just ends up flying off and. You know, we have like a derailment, train derailment. So the shuttle shelf is really helpful for that, you know, for allowing the kids. And I find that um, it's not something that they have to do all the time. You know, when they feel the need to be, um, have more support, they have it. And sometimes they switch off and they'll go use a different limb. Um, and that's the key also, is that when you're welcoming people to your studio, is to ask them, I have adaptive equipment. Is there anything you need in particular? You know, does anyone have any difficulty that, you know, we can help with? And that's important as well. Uh, and uh, I don't have an image of the hand switcher, uh, but uh, for that, you don't have to use your feet on the pedals. You can actually uh, push on the harnesses to make the uh, warp go up and down. Um, uh, and the way with the harness is in the back has the weight. That's why it switches. Yeah. It. Yes. Um, so that's also very helpful as well. Uh, I will say that uh, uh, the other day I had a bunch of people who were like, I'm ha who I noticed were having trouble uh, switching uh, with their feet. And I like couldn't figure out what the issue was. And then I realized that um, uh, some of the equipment that had been put on uh, was getting in the way <laughs> of switching the feet. And I didn't realize it until we were like three people in, uh, <laughs> like three weavers in. And I was like, oh, you know, I, I noticed they were having issues, but they're people who, you know, they don't know what the, the loom is like. Maybe they're just having trouble that day. And I didn't realize until, again, three weavers in. So sometimes you have to be looking <laughs> uh, and it was uh, some of the adaptive equipment was getting in the way just because it all I had to do was like, switch like move something to the side and then they could be easy so it's super simple um, that, that, happened to me, <laughs> that happened to me with the chain we have chains on the the wheelchair accessible loom and the loom that have the height extenders 
So it, it allows the pedal to come down to a proper, um, you know, height. And a couple of times I've taken the chains off in transportation, but have forgotten if it's back on. So the pedals are almost like a 90 degree angle. <laughs> You know, it's very hard for them to be adjusted. And so it's it's really important as well. It, everything's a tool, but we do have to check our equipment and we have to check that everything is functioning as well. Mm -hmm. But it's really great that uh, Sori has those adjustments and equipment ready um, if you do want to customize things for people. Um, we use them a lot. <laughs> Um, feel free to ask more questions in the chat. Um, uh, but thank you all for giving suggestions to each other and share skill sharing a little bit. <laughs> um, I have a question for Karen. Um, she mentioned in the chat that they put a half circle on each pedal. Is that because they they put it on the side that their feet were slipping off to the side. And you can feel free to type or unmute uh, if that's more comfortable. Yeah, that's me. Um, I'm just was looking to see if I had a picture I could show you. So can you guys see that? Mm. Ah, okay. So it just makes the pedals wider. Um, Cause I noticed some, a couple of our people that were using the loom, their feet were slipping off the pedals because it's sort of narrow. And then actually on our, this is our new one, on our other loom, we painted them different colors. So when I'm helping somebody, I can say, put your foot on the red one, put your foot on the green one or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. as oh, that's I'm that's amazing. We've, we've had that issue too, and I've never thought of doing that. <laughs> it's working great. It works really well. That's a good so idea. Far, yeah, so far everyone's been able to switch pedals with their feet, but I'm going to look into that um, hand switcher because I, I, when I, when you're talking about the pedal, my challenge with pedals is mainly shortness that people weren't able to read the pedals comfortably, um, yeah. kids and adults. So when I was talking about blocks, I made blocks out of cardboard where it sort of um, adds some height to the pedal so that they, they can, or the adults. So as people with short legs could reach. That makes sense. Exactly. Right. So, and I do the same thing with um, the piccolo. When the piccolo is in the smallest uh, position, um, and I've had kids as young as two and three years old really wanting to do it. So I use my own hand as the hand switcher on the heddles. So because when I've asked, then, you know, a sibling or a parent, they go, can you help them with switching their feet? The child gets very frustrated. Like, no, I can do it myself. But in doing so, they're not exactly getting the rhythm. So I just subtly put my hand up on the on the, the shuttle, I mean, on the, um, on the head of, and just push down with my hand. So they don't see it, but it's really, you know, oftentimes we have to, to guide people from, from uh, the behind the scenes. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you for the picture. Uh, and you know, I really like hearing all these these DIY <laughs> uh, added uh, adjustments too, because you know we'd love to have equipment for everything, <laughs> uh, but you know things again, everybody needs help in a different way, and so we're kind of always inventing new ways to what mm -hmm. address the support that people need. Yeah, and we will also want people to do, you know, as much as possible, like whole process of weaving, like even the people who have their own salary rooms, they're scared to make their own warps. But I now encourage them, now you have a loom, now you want to learn the whole process of weaving, which is setting up your own loom, not, you know, just asking me to make custom made or pre-made, uh, buying a pre-made warp. Um, so it's also our, you know, work that if the salary doesn't make any adaptive tools, like I don't have a picture, but I have a particular girl. She she's a several palsy, so she needs a shadow tray. She she has to use the hand switcher because she cannot use her feet. Um, and then we used to I used to wind her bobbin, but um, this it's hard to grab for her to wind. So I just wrapped with a cardboard to make it longer. Or even a uh, PVS pipe or whatever it's called. Yeah, PVC. Yeah, PVC pipe. 
then now she can do it. So even just a little thing, um, if she can do it, she is doing more weaving process on her own. Um, and then, so that's kind of also our job. If we, you know, we are working with person who needs a little bit of help of weaving. Yeah, and I think you had a picture of that in the last talk, uh, which was really cool to see. <laughs> but it's a it's a great thing. It's a great thing. <laughs> And I think that that's something we have. A lot of people want to make their own bobbins. Um, you know, I, uh, one thing I was going to mention is like warping is so intimidating. <laughs> it's intimidating for me. And I think every, I've, all of us say like warping is like not our favorite thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so I, it's. I agree. Mm -hmm. Warping yeah. is not the favorite. Sometimes, no, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it can be wrong. Yes. Uh, and so it's always good. You start with the weaving and then you introduce making your bobbin and then way down the line, eventually you get to the warping. And so we often start when we first teach, whether it's on a Saori loom or a Cricut loom or uh, even the cardboard, we'll often start with things pre-warped. Even if it's like cardboard is easy to warp, but we'll often start with it pre-warped because once they weave for the first time, then that you gain the confidence, it's a lot easier, and then it'll give you motivation to learn the other things. Like if I tried, I try to do the bobbin first or do it while I'm teaching them how to weave, sometimes it's too much all at once. Uh, it's right. too much to remember. So usually start with the weaving, then learn the bobbin, and then we'll learn more advanced things from there. Mm -hmm. That was one of my biggest challenges was becoming friends with the working process because it was not exactly my first love weaving at all. Like I preferred spinning because the spinning process is very meditative and when you finish you had something. You had a ball of yarn and you had a skein. But with weaving there was so many steps in the process and especially from the traditional point of weaving where everything had to be exact. It was very overwhelming for me. And uh, so my first sort of four-way, uh, first step into uh, weaving was on a triangle loom. So there was no cutting a, a separate warp or weft. It was all, you know, one at a time. Um, basically, it was a large glorified pot holder, <laughs> um, but it was like two meters wide on the hypotenuse. But what I found also is when you're dealing with new weavers, especially adults, is that you want them to have fun. You want them to enjoy the process. And it's okay if they just keep weaving and just keep weaving. But it comes to a point where you have to also finish off those fringes or decide what you're going to do and not just leave yourself a stack of fabric or a, st a stack of textiles. Create something more with it. And so that's the next step also is, okay, what is this going to be now? What is this saying to you? Is it, you know, do you want it to be a functional object? Do you want to wear it? Do you love the beauty of it? Do you want to use it as a, you know, a coat throw or something? Um, do you just want to wrap yourself in the colors? So it's really getting them to think about beyond the process once you finish the project. Okay, so what's going to happen next? Where's, you know, where are you going to go with this? And that's okay too, because that's another process that they have to, um, that we all have to to go through. And um, you know, some of these tasks, like this, the twisting of fringes or actually warping and threading the loom, it can be boring, it can be mundane, but you have to ask yourself, well, how can I make this more enjoyable? How can I make this fun? How can I appreciate the process? So you start with the music, you start with the rhythm, you start with paying attention to your breathing because if you're holding your breath while you're trying to thread 350 threads you know it doesn't you know it doesn't help you but if you just learn to say okay okay one breath at a time one one thread at a time and also you can do it with a friend or a kid that's willing to help you you know if you do it with somebody it also helps um we had someone in the chat uh, express that they need help with switching projects on and off. Uh, Chiaki offered to help, so we'll connect you. <laughs> uh, I'm, always, I'm always doing this. <laughs> right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, I think all of us are. Uh -huh. That's how I learned in Japan. The Saori school, when you're coming in the morning, all the rooms are empty, nothing in the, in the inside, because we all share. So you bring up the box of my own box, and then put the, my project. And at the end of the day, you make that room empty. So the next day, somebody else can use the room. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we have a comment in the chat. Uh, I this is oh yeah hi Anne. Uh, I work at Creative Growth in Oakland, California. What do you do with all of the fabric when it is done? The weavers weave more fabric than I can support. Most folks want to make clothes, but that step is mostly left up to me and volunteers. So, uh, can I? Is it okay if I respond? Yeah, um, I completely identify with this. The uh, the load of fabric. Um, I think the easiest way is to keep the project and simple, you know, and also encourage the weaver to participate. It shouldn't be, regard I feel that regardless of anyone's disability, that everyone needs to partic participate in the process, you know, um, so that goes from anywhere from designing it to sewing it up or to, to sewing on buttons or creating uh, like a new project out of it that everyone needs to partic participate in the process so as a first step sometimes the easiest is to make a pillow or a bag because you're dealing with either just three seams or just four seams um in, a, in an opening so you can either do a button opening or just a flap opening um or you can even do a large shawl or a large blanket so you can sew strips together um, and keep it simple. So this way that everyone can participate, it doesn't have to be a situation where you have your students or you have the creators and then you have the facilitator doing all the extra work. And I feel that for ourselves as facilitators, it's really, really important that we don't find ourselves in this position of sort of doing the, the final push the final uh, project because it should be from beginning to end the work of the creator or the work of the student regardless of the disability um obviously there are some situations where they might need to have more support but at the end of the day before someone moves on to weaving more we also have to say okay you know what we were in a lot let's see what we can do with what you've done and what we can create with that and take a pause, pause for a little bit. Make that a one-week pause or, or you know, a two-day pause from producing more work. And you complete what you've started. Yeah, uh, we actually, uh, uh, you know, we often involve the artist in what they want to do. Again, sometimes it is complicated. We're like, we don't know how to do it either. Let's figure it out together. Like you can look at, a, you know, if they're like, okay, so what kind of thing do you want to make and give them a couple of options. If they say a jacket, okay, let's look up some, the easier jacket options and see what, and talk about how we can work through it. Um, mm -hmm. And it may not be perfect. It may not, you know, be exactly the vision, but that's again, part of the process and learning and figuring things out. Mm -hmm. um, and we also, so we try to have examples of things that we've done before so that people can literally see it but if we don't have an exact example um and we're trying to figure out what people want especially if they're nonverbal, um we do have um sort of these sheets that we can use um so like sometimes we ask people what do you want to happen to your art do you want to take it home do you want to have it be part of an exhibit do you want to gift it to somebody do you want to sell it um just so that we get a baseline of like what do you want to happen and they can gesture to it um, and then it's also, what would you like your art to be? Would you like it to be hanging? Would you like it to be clothing? Would you like to be jewelry? Pillows are very popular, as was mentioned in the comments. Pillows are very easy to make um, and very usable. Um, bags are pretty easy, too, to make a simple bag. Um, uh, sometimes you can take sections and put them on a card. A scarf, if you have a length of fabric, it's a scarf. Don't have to do too much adjusting for that, necessarily. Um, but we do have people make dolls, um, and people make them not like, you know, I guess you would call them like retail worthy <laughs> dolls. 
uh, but that's what makes them unique and charming. Um, uh, I would like to pull up an image. I don't have one on hand right now, but I, I mean, you saw the Shopkins earlier, uh, but there are some that are bodies and we have people who will like draw out the shape to start. And so you'll do the outline of the shape, cut it out of the fabric and do that twice and then sew it together. Again, it's not necessarily the most elegant thing, but it's simple. Like a gingerbread cookie, almost. It's like a gingerbread cookie outline, and then it makes it very easy as well. Yes, so gingerbread cookie is a way to put is the good way to put it. Um, uh, would you be willing to share this as a model? Yeah, I'm happy to share this uh, and send it out. I'll send it out in the post uh, uh, email. Um, uh, so yeah, it's just like you want to encourage people's creativity and also like. As adults, <laughs> let go of the fear of doing something new too, I think. Like, it's really intimidating. I will say myself, I am not great at sewing and I need to learn and I'm afraid of it, but try it out, you know, and sit, and also allow them to see like, if it doesn't work out perfectly, like, well, we learned and we'll try again on the next, you know, thing you weave. Uh, don't be afraid to cut into things. Don't be afraid to, to try new, make boldly. Like the cutting the cutting is really hard for me sometimes um I, I, that's why i end up with a lot of shawls and scarves because i i can't bring myself to cut it um but another thing is i like cut it up you know felt it sometimes things get felted and distorted in a certain way that it's not wearable so it becomes cut up and re into something else so i really like that process as well mm -hmm. Yeah, especially, yeah, I still remember when I first made a garment, my hand was shaking with my scissors. Is this the right place to cut? And, but the joy I meant is because I really didn't like sewing. I still don't like sewing, but the first garment you looked at in the mirror and it, I wove this fabric and it put it together, even the stitch is not straight. But mm -hmm. it's all about if you do it and then the feeling even though, you know, like I said, stitch, I feel like I attached it. <laughs> it's not, I didn't feel like I sold, but I, that's the feeling. And then you want to have the same feeling. Again, that motivate you to, you know, I still don't make clothing with sleeves because it's different, I know you need more process. But I like, it's just a try out, you might be able to do it. So it's a pillow is a good, simple things to do to start with. And then uh, one example, uh, my one of my mentors in Japan, she used to help um, at a facility for people with mental disabilities. And they, she had enough volunteers and their mothers as a uh, sewing. So they made pencil cases, scarves, and then my mentor's job was to see if this person's weaving piece was like soft, then scarf. If this person uses a rebel bulky yarn and then he beats so hard, so not suitable for scarf, maybe for a bag or you know something else. And then the mothers or volunteers put it together because they used to sell those work. Um, so there are many patterns, depends on where you belong to. So that's only my you know example. And then make sure that once you finish. This is from your woven piece became a bag and now it's ready to go, you know, find uh, forever, how, however form. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so oh, each place has a situation, but that's one of my uh, mentors example that she used to help uh, facilitate for people with mental disabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we are have, yeah, she didn't have involved those clients because their job was to weave. Uh, so we are at time, it is 1230. I did want to just quickly show a visual example uh, of that cookie cutter thing. I had a, I was looking for the picture. Um, so we see that there's this piece of fabric. We have a paper template that's sort of that cookie cutter. They sewed around that sort of template. It's good to leave like some extra room uh, around the template uh, for when you sew it. Um, I know the neck came out a little bit thin. This was one of our teaching artists like first uh, uh, you know, projects making a doll with somebody, uh, and they did an amazing job. Uh, I, uh, this is it, like sort of intermediate before it's stuffed, and then we have uh the actual uh teddy bear. Um, 
so you know again don't be afraid uh to uh just try it and do it uh it's nerve-wracking uh but it's rewarding when you do it too um, yeah uh, so thank you, everybody, for joining us for Disability Hacks, our second edition. Uh, we'll have two more of these at some point. Might be a yearly thing. We'll see when we <laughs> uh, get to it again. Um, but I do want to just share um, and flash some contact information. Don't worry if you can't grab it right here. Uh, this is being recorded, and we'll send out the recording, um, and it'll have this info on it. Shameless plug. Uh, and for Intertwined Arts, we have two in-person events next, one that's this week at Carl Schertz Park uh, in New York, Weaving in the Woods, uh, and then we have our fundraiser in October, which is going to be lots of fun. We have looms there. We're going to have a fashion show, uh, so I highly recommend going to that. This is also part of New York Textile Month, I should mention, uh, and Weaving in the Woods is part of New York Textile Month as well. Happy Textile Month. Uh, and also shameless plug, please donate if you have the ability to. Uh, every donation helps us do more webinars like this and supports our work, leading with people with disabilities. Uh, and I want to thank you all for joining us and Yael and Chiaki for being amazing panelists with so much experience. Um, and maybe we'll see you all in a future webinar. <laughs>